Father, we thank you once more for your great love and energy towards us. We thank you that you're working out the plan with us in a way that we can understand it. We thank you that although it's a mystery, you can reveal it to us by your Spirit. We thank you that you sent Jesus and that he's the link. By his own Spirit, he instructs us. May we be open to it. May we understand May we be willing to follow wherever you lead us. We thank you in his holy name. Amen. We, uh, are moving further and further into the knowledge of the mystery. Today will be fairly easy to keep track of because it's all going to come out of Volume 7a, Ellen White's comments in just one chapter. So we won't be wandering all over the place today. It'll be really easy to follow. Next uh, time will also be easy because we're going to follow just the chapter, Hebrews, the second chapter. So if you have a, a 7a, you might want to bring it with you. Just follow right on along. Okay. On page 11... 26 of volume 5 B.C. The chapter on John 1. Now, we all remember John 1 begins in the beginning. Okay. Now, that is not always. Okay. Always doesn't have a beginning. <laughs> so, whatever John is talking about, it has a beginning. It says, in the beginning... The Word, that's Jesus, was with God. And of course, anybody knows who's, who's thinking just the smallest little amount that if you're with somebody, that somebody is not also you. You're with somebody, that means there's two people. There's two something. So, in the beginning, the Word was with God. So, whatever God is, is not the Word. Okay, in the beginning, the word was with God. Now, when it says the word was God, it's a different word there. You look it up in Strong's Concordance. The two words are theos and theon. Two completely different words for God. Okay, now the one word means the nature of God, that's the Father. And the other word means divine. So, it shouldn't be God two times. It should be God one time and divine the second time. So, in verse, in John, the very first verse, John is saying this. And he knew what he was saying in the Greek. And you can't miss it in the Greek. It's in the English where you have the problem. In the Greek it says, in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God. They were together in that beginning. And the Word was also divine. That's what John was saying. So the Word and God are both divine. <laughs> There's no problem with that. There is no logical problem. You have two beings and they're both divine. That's easy, isn't it? <laughs> That's what John was saying. You cannot get a trinity idea out of that. You cannot do it. Okay? So then, I only am saying this to remind you that today's study, based on Alan White's comments that somebody compiled, is about that verse. The Word was there at the beginning, but He wasn't alone. He was with God, and the Word and God are both divine. So that's our study today. All right, let's look at it. These are Ellen White's comments. There are light and glory in the truth that Christ was one with the Father before the foundation of the world. Now, why does she have to add before? Well, she's talking about the pre-existence, for one thing, of Christ. Now, why is there a problem with the pre-existence of Christ? 
Because most people who do not study the Bible or the spirit of prophecy think that Jesus is called the Son of God as a human. Now, he is called the Son of God as a human, but he was the Son of God before he became a human. That's what she's trying to point out. So if Jesus was with God before the world was, he had to be the Son of God before he became a human. Okay, so that's all in here. All right, so it says, Christ was one with the Father before the foundation of the world was laid. This is the light shining in a dark place, making it resplendent with divine or original glory. This truth. What truth? That Jesus, the Son of God, was with God before, before creation. Well, at least before the foundation of this world in this statement. Okay. So she says, that's the light. That's the light. The God, the only true God, and His Son, the Divine Son, were together before the creation of the world. Okay. So she says, this truth, infinitely mysterious in itself, explains other mysteries. Well, if you don't know what we just went through, you're not going to get an explanation of the other mysteries. They will always be a mystery to you. <clears throat> For example, who died on the cross. You can't discover who died on the cross if you don't know this opening statement of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was divine. You can't get to the rest of it without that. John's Gospel will make no sense to you if you don't get the first verse. <laughs> So let's follow this. Uh, otherwise unexplainable truths, while it is enshrined in light, unapproachable and incomprehensible. Now, this is taken from the Review and Herald, April 5th, 1906, which is one of the most outstanding things she ever wrote on this subject of the Incarnation. Let's continue now. The next little section says the Apostle would call our attention from ourselves to the author of our salvation. He presents before us his two natures. Who is he talking about? Can it be anybody else? Is there anybody else involved? It says his. That's one person. Jesus. He is the author of our Salvation. So let's continue. His two natures, divine and human. How many beings in all eternity does that describe? <laughs> Do you see how simple this is? Jesus is divine and human. Is the Father divine and human? No. So there's something the Father has not done it. He's never going to do. We can say it's impossible for him to do it, as a matter of fact. I don't want to have to explain that because there are a lot of impossibilities for God. It's impossible for him to sin. Did you know it's impossible? Yes. I can name you a whole list of impossibles, but I have people telling me all the time nothing's impossible to God. That's ridiculous. There are lots of things he absolutely cannot do and still be God. <laughs> So let's continue here. His two natures, divine and human. Here is the description of the divine. Who being in the form. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Philippians 2, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And the word robbery here doesn't mean to rob. It means to grasp, to hold on to something. He, he didn't think it was a big deal to hold on to the fact that he was divine because he had something better to do with his, his own life. That was to sacrifice himself to save us. So he didn't think he needed to hold on to being divine. He would give it up for us. Now, I don't know how many people see that in that verse, but that's what Paul is trying to tell us. That 
that the nature of Jesus is to be totally unselfish to the point he wouldn't even hold on to being the divine Son of God. He would give up all of his prerogatives as a God to make himself of no reputation, it says, that means he would empty himself. He was willing to empty himself, to give up self-will and leave everything with the Father. Now, we're talking about a God and the God, and he's saying, I'll step down, down, down until there's no further place down to go. Yes, he didn't just say, I will step down a notch. He says, I'll go down until there's no place downer to go. And that's exactly what he did. He not only emptied himself, but he allowed mankind to turn him into a criminal and then put him on a cross and kill him like the worst criminals on the planet. And then he wouldn't even have a burial place. They'd just throw him over in a plot of ground where they throw the criminals. This is the Son of God. But he volunteered for it. That's what the incarnation means. He didn't have to be incarnated. Nobody could make him do it. He volunteered. He said, the only way we can save humanity. So let's continue here. That first sentence of John is what's going to lighten all of this up for us. You can't understand the plan without John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, continuing. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He was the brightness of His glory, the Father, and the express image of His person, the Father. Jesus was the express image he was just like. There's a just like. That one works. <laughs> he was just like his father. But he was not the father. We have to remember that. He was not the father. You can never make Jesus be the father and you cannot make the father be Jesus. You can't make that switch. It's impossible. All right. So dealing with Paul here, it says, Now of the human. He was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He voluntarily assumed human nature. It was his own act and by his own consent. He clothed his divinity with humanity. Now, does that give you any pictures? I think it's a really good picture. It says he clothed. Have you ever done that? Have you ever clothed yourself with something? What do you do when you clothe yourself? <laughs> it's easy, isn't it? You put something on. But whatever you put on yourself, that isn't you. You're still you. You just have clothes on now. <laughs> the real Jesus was the divine Son of God. Now he clothed himself with humanity. Okay? And we know that she says it other ways. As a matter of fact, in the Greek it says it other ways. Garb. Garb. That's clothing. <laughs> he garbed himself. He had a guise. We went through this in one of the early meetings. He, he had the guise of humanity. That's the Greek. He had the guise, which means the humanity was not him. The real him is the divine son of God. The divine, the human, it will be a true human nature, but it must be combined with his divine or there's nothing to work with. So he, he, he took the form of a human the likeness is the way Paul says it. He took the likeness, the appearance, the uh, fashion, he also uses that word, of a human. That's what everybody saw. He, he looked exactly like them because he was a real human 
but that's not who he himself was. He is the divine son of God with his form. And what people never saw was that before that, he was in the form of God. <laughs> but he gave up that form. And the question can come up, and it's a legitimate question, well, what did he do with his form? What do you do with a form you don't have anymore? It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. So we can never explain any of this, how, how he did it. But Jesus gave up his form as God, but he did not cease being God. See, that's the mistake a lot of people make. They think since he gave up the form, he was no longer God. Now he's a man. No, he never gave up who he was. He gave up the form. And we have no idea what it is to take off your skin and still be alive. We don't know that. We haven't done that one. But if you can put your mind around that and say, I'm going to give up my form now and start, start taking your skin off, that's a terrible thought, isn't it? Well, we don't know what Jesus did, but he gave up his form. And he took another one, the form of man. And the problem here is that it's irreversible. When he became a human, he could never take it back the other way. He's still the divine Son of God in that form, but he will always retain that form now. So whatever happened to his God form, it's gone. For all eternity, forever, it's gone. He is now in the form of a man to always be identified with us. All right, I'm not going to continue in that. I'm trying to follow what Ellen White is telling us here. He clothed his divinity with humanity. He was all the while as God, but he did not appear. There's the word likeness. You see? He did not appear as God. He veiled the demonstrations of deity. So here he is, the... the Divine Son of God, but he's he's got a veil, he's got it disguised. He has a guise now. He has the garb of humanity. These are all Alan White words, and they're good translations of the Greek. All right, continuing. He veiled the demonstrations of deity, which commanded had commanded the high major call forth the admiration of the universe of God. He was God while upon the earth. But he divested himself of the form of God. See? We're starting to get little flavors of this. What these words mean. He was divested. He divested himself of the form of God and instead took the form and fashion of a man. Now she's using Paul's words. He walked the earth as a man. For our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. What does she mean he became poor? How poor did he become? <laughs> well, you have to figure it out first. How rich was he? <laughs> How rich was he before? <laughs> Well, we have no way of knowing that. <laughs> because he and the Father owned everything. <laughs> How rich is that? <laughs> and not only were they rich that way, but they had all power together. Well, how much is all power? Well, who knows what that is? <laughs> Job, in talking about this, says, Oh, oh, you look at what God has done. And of course, you talk about Jesus here. Look at those, those suns and those stars and those galaxies. Look at the numbers, billions. Look at the weight. Who can know what the sun weighs? And that's a tiny one. But tell you, it's Beetlejuice. It's 350 times bigger than our sun. Who can measure the distances? Who can measure any of this? And Job says, who can know 
the thunders of his power when all we get is the little whispers. That's what we're looking at is the whispers of God, those billions of suns and planets and the universe, everything physical we can know about, that's just the whisper of what he can do. <laughs> I like what John said. Who can understand the thunders of what he can do? <laughs> that's Jesus. That's who he was. He was rich in all of that. And he said, we'll leave that here for now. I'll go down there and be one of those. <laughs> what, a, what a sound. Yeah. Can you believe how could he stoop to not only be part of his creation because he had to join the creation as a created being in order to deal with us. So he took our form as a created being. A body has not prepared me. So Jesus now joins the creation as a created being. He's God and now he's a creature. So here we're, we're starting to look at things about the Incarnation we were never told before because a Trinitarian can't explain these things. They don't understand any of it. As a matter of fact, they think it's heresy. Yes, but we're reading the truth from Ellen White and the Bible. So Jesus became poor. We can understand a little bit about that, what it means to be Poor, that's not only giving up money, that's giving up everything you had before. So now it becomes poor that we can become rich. What does that mean? Yes, we can be like Jesus. We can have His Spirit. We can be co-heirs, joint heirs with Him. Whatever He owns, we will own too. <laughs> that is a sound amazing. Okay, there's a lot we can do with this to understand it, but we're trying to understand what Ellen White is saying about the Incarnation right now. And the interesting thing to me is it's in this book that Adventists all have on their shelves. Yeah, who reads it? Who reads anything? Continuing. He became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. He laid aside his glory, his majesty. He was God, but the glories of the form of God he for a while relinquished. Now, don't get mixed up here. It doesn't say he gave up his form as God for a while. It doesn't say that. It says the glories. <laughs> That's the word. He gave up the glories. Of the form of God for a while. He released that for a while. Though he walked among men in poverty, scattering his blessings wherever he went, at his word, legions of angels would surround the Redeemer and do him homage. But he walked on the earth unrecognized, unconfessed, and with but few exceptions by his creatures. His creatures. The atmosphere was polluted with sins and curses in place of the anthem of praise. His law was poverty and humiliation as he passed to and fro upon his mission of mercy to relieve the sick, to lift up the depressed. Scarce a solitary voice called him blessed and the very greatest of the nation passed him by with disdain. She's talking about the leaders of the church here. It's very plain what she's talking about and she never says anything different than this. It's always they completely mistook who he was and they always treated him bad. The leaders of the church, they would not believe he was the Son of God. Even though they were told. And even though some of them knew it, they couldn't give up the paycheck. Yes, they couldn't give up the power. They couldn't give up, shall I list all the things that they couldn't give up? They couldn't say he was the Son of God. They couldn't say it. 
All right, continuing. He humbled himself. And he took mortality upon him. Now let's get a hold of this. Ellen White says he, the divine son of God, took the form of a man and he kept going lower and lower and lower till there was no lower place to go. But part of it was when he did that, he took mortality upon himself. What does that mean? Now he can die. That's right. What? What do you mean now he can die? He's God. God can't die. Well, that's true. God as a God cannot die. But if he turns himself into a man, that man can die. Now she says, but... As a member of the human family, he was mortal. Okay? She just left of it. Now he's mortal. But as a God, now I want to stop there. Are you catching these little words that she throws out every now and then? She says, but as a God. Yeah, she didn't say, but as the God. She didn't say that. She can't say it because it's not in the Bible. It's not the truth. She said as a God. Now, what does John say in the first verse? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was a God. That's exactly what he said. Do you know why Seventh-day Adventists hate to say that? And I mean they hate it. It's because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses is saying. Yes! Now, isn't it a horrible shame that the Jehovah's Witnesses are right about that verse? And we can't say it because we don't believe they're right. And if we said it their way, that would mean the Sunday keepers would look at us the same way they look at Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you see how strong that motivation is not to be a Jehovah's Witness? Obviously, the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong about lots of things. But they got that verse right. How did the devil do that? <laughs> I think it's pretty clever. That the devil got the one place he didn't want anybody to believe, so he gave it to them so nobody would believe it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But Ellen White says, as a God. That's Ellen White. Are we going to give her up like we gave up to all witnesses? I think a lot of people have. They've given up Ellen White. He was mortal, but as a God, he was the fountain of life to the world. He could, in his divine person, ever have withstood the advances of death. Now, she doesn't say here he could as a human divine person. She didn't say that. That's another place where people get the senses wrong. She said as a divine person. That means as God, he could ever have withstood the advances of death and refused to come under his dominion. But he laid down his life. How did he do that? By becoming a human. See? We have to get the thoughts together here. We have to keep them together. He became a human. That means he's immortal. And when he did that, he laid down the ability to be immortal forever now. He gave it up. The human was going to die. That's all there was to it. And when that human died, the divinity would go with him. Because it was his form. Can you live without your body? Well, neither could he. See there? Now, there are people who accuse us of saying that if his spirit comes to us, that means we're dualists. The spirit can live separate from the body. No. Nobody has ever said that who understands these things. When his spirit comes to us, it's him. There's no separation. Okay? His humanity is in heaven, but his, by his spirit, he is omnipresent. And that's where the confusion comes in. I have received emails in not too distant the past, uh, 
minister saying that Jesus could not be omnipresent as a human. He can only do it by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has to be another person. Yes. It's the same old Trinity stuff. And it doesn't make any kind of sense. We have to read Ellen White. But even reading Ellen White, we've got to purge our brains from the old lies we used to believe. It's hard to overcome some of that. Continuing. Uh, continuing. He uh, might give life and bring immortality. Uh, he might bring uh, life and immortality to life. He bore the sins of the world and endured the penalty which rolled like a mountain upon his divine soul. Who was paying the price? Was it just a human? No, she says, his divine soul. That's the Son of God. That's deity. The deity was having this happening to him because he now had the form of a human. Continuing, he, who's the he? Divine soul, we just read it. He, the divine soul, yielded up his life, a sacrifice that man should not eternally die. He died. Who's he? The eternal soul. It's real. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't use the right word. His divine soul. His divine soul. His divine soul. The, the, the divine Son of God. That soul, is, she says, he died. Not through being compelled to die, but by his own free will. So the divine Son of God voluntarily found a way to die. And he did. He became a mortal man. She says, this was humility. <laughs> oh, what a statement. This was humility. And that word humility means bending down, down, down. That's what Jesus did. He bent down, down, down. I heard Karsten Johnson say that at the seminary. And there were people who ridiculed him there. They said, you're making that up. No, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Spirit of Prophecy teaches. And Karsten Johnson picked it up. He was a Christian theologian and a philosopher who understood the philosophy of God. That's different than the world's philosophy. He died. This is humility. The whole treasure of heaven came in one gift. Then she says, wondrous combination of man and God. Now, one of the biggest problems that people who try to understand these things make is they want to separate it out and just talk either about his divine self or his human self. They forget you can't separate them. You have to talk about this one person who was both divine and human at the same time. You can't make them do different things because it's only one person. All right. It says, He might have helped his human nature to withstand the inroads of disease by pouring from his divine nature vitality and undecaying vigor to the human. But he humbled himself. He, the divine Son of God, humbled himself to the man's nature. Which means, whatever happened to the man, whatever the man chose, that's what the divine Son of God would do because the human is his life now. He's living the life of a human as a human and he would die as a human. The plan was entered into by the Son of God knowing all the steps. <laughs> He knew all, all these 
things were going to happen to him, and we haven't even begun to, to even discover them yet, but he knew all of it before he ever came. He must descend to make an expiation for the sins of a condemned, groaning world. What humility is this? It amazed angels. They didn't understand it. They could never come up with this in their own minds. They couldn't see this kind of a sacrifice from God. How could he do this? The imagination cannot take it in. The eternal word consented to be made flesh. God became man. You see, that's what we're talking about, is the incarnation. We're getting the hints now. We're beginning to see a little bit of what it means. Well, he, he came here to help us, and it says there was no safe place for him. <laughs> no safe place. Everybody wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. They want to hang him. They want to stick a knife on him. They want to get rid of this fellow. He's, he's really making us feel bad. He had to flee from place to place for his life. <coughs> he was betrayed by one of his disciples. He was denied by one of his most zealous followers. He was mocked. He was crowned with a crown of thorns. He was scourged. He was forced to bear the burden of the cross. He felt the bitterness as no other human being could feel it. He was pure, holy, and undefiled. Who believes it? Oh no, he was just like a... Do you see what a horrible statement that is? No, he was pure, holy, and undefiled. <coughs> Yet he was arraigned as a criminal. He stepped down from the highest exaltation. Step by step, he humbled himself to die. Shameful, cruel death. He did not die as a hero. He endured the cross, despised the shame. Yeah, we don't hardly think about that too much. He despised the shame of it all. But he didn't do it just to save us. He did it for the whole universe. They've got to see who God really is, his father, and he was living the life of his father on this earth through a man. <laughs> so all this unselfishness, all this suffering, it's the father doing it through the son. Now there seems to be some controversy about what the father does and what the son does, but I think this shouldn't be a big deal if we understand the incarnation. Jesus became a man not to show what God can do. He didn't come to show you what the Word can do on this earth, a pure holy Word who is divine. He came to show us what a man can do with the Spirit of God in him. But it wasn't His Spirit doing it. It was His Father's Spirit or the whole experiment would not have worked. Jesus couldn't call his spirit to do things for himself that we can't do. So he says, I'm going to be doing things just like a man. And the only power I can get is what is available to man, the spirit of the Father. Divinity. And when Jesus went back to heaven, he asked for a gift for us. And the Father gave it to him. He says, you have my permission to send your spirit to be the power in humans the way I was the power in you. 
So nobody gets power from the Father directly. Trinitarians believe that's what they get. But they're not getting anything from the Father directly. It's through Jesus. He's the only name by which we can be saved. Jesus. Everything has to have His prescription on it. Everything has to be Jesus. That means there's no third God. Did you get that? It's got to be Jesus Himself. Continuing. Christ was to die as man's substitute. Now, when you read these kinds of statements, don't uh, think human race, because that's what the devil wants you to do. Oh, he saved everybody. No. It doesn't matter to you if he saved everybody. It doesn't help you one bit. He saved me. He saved me. He died for me. He suffered for me. As though there was nobody else around. He did it all for me. And if I actually was the only one he was had to say, he would have done it anyhow. For me. So when I see them putting the nails in his hands, I can stand there and look at that and say, he's taking that for me. For me. And it's the truth. So who am I? She says, he, he had the sentence of death for transgression of the law of God as a traitor, a rebel. That's who I am. I'm a traitor to God. I'm a rebel. And I might as well get that figured out because I'm always trying to figure out some way that I'm a good guy and somehow I was just born on this planet and that's my problem. No, you're not a good guy at all. You're a traitor. You're a rebel. You're a sinner. And the proof of that is, it was your choice. <laughs> yes. Is anybody going to come out and tell God, I never chose to sin. I can't help it. It's my nature. <laughs> of course you chose to sin. That's what sin is. Transgression of the law means I'm choosing it, even though it's my nature. Jesus said, I came to get rid of that nature. Now what's your excuse? <laughs> yeah. You don't have to have that nature anymore. I died for you, so you don't have it. At least it's a power. Let's continue here. We don't want to get into too many areas at the same time here. He stood in the place of the traitors, that's us, every one of us, with all their treasured sins. You mean I treasure my sins? Well, you must or you wouldn't do them. <laughs> I mean, how do you do something you don't like doing? Who does that? You have to be some sort of a nut. You only do what you like doing. With all their treasured sins upon what? His divine He's not taking this as a mere human. It's his divine soul that's doing it because he's made himself a human. But he has not ceased to be God. He still is God. So he, as a divine being with a form of a man, is paying the price. All the way through. He is paying the price. And it wasn't enough that he die. He must die in a shameful way. Because it's what we deserve. We deserve to die in the most shameful way there is. I don't think any of us have really understood that yet. What we really deserve. Every now and then we catch a clue. Oh, I'm not a saint yet. Oh, I wish I wasn't like this. Oh, I wish I didn't have that habit. Those are little, little tiny clues. <laughs> we have to have those clues because we haven't figured out yet. Man, if I got what I deserved. <laughs> if I got what I deserved. What a horrible thought that is. If I got what I deserved. Well, do you know what happened to what you deserve? Jesus got it. Yeah. He got it.
got what you and I deserve. And it was for real. He took it all. And that's another thing we're not used to thinking about. You mean he really took it all? That means there's nothing left. Well, if there's nothing left, how come I'm not doing it his way? (laughs) It's because we don't believe it yet. That he really took it all. She says, I say to the followers of Christ, they don't want any shame. They don't want any humiliation. They don't want to be put down. She says, I say to you people who think you're Christians, look to Calvary and blush for shame. (laughs) Yeah, blush for shame. Uh, your self-important idea. <laughs> Are we starting to get the incarnation? Is something opening up to us? The wonder of what Jesus did. And it was the only way he could save us because Alan White says the great controversy, infinite wisdom knew there was no other way except for his son to die. So Jesus did the only thing that could be done. He had to come. He had to make himself mortal. He had to put himself where the human was in control. The human had to be a perfect human or the whole thing would have been lost. And the human showed us that with the power of God in you, you can be a perfect human. As that perfect human, he could take all of our sins And then he said, give them to me. They're mine now. I'll pay for them. And they killed him. Broken heart. She says, we ought to blush for shame. (laughs) She says, it's after Christ. What are we giving up? What is it we're giving up? Our darling sin. For him to die for. Our darling sins. That word darling is terrible. (laughs) They must be darling or we give them up. It says he he was guilty for us. And he went lower and lower and lower in his humiliation. Until there was no lower. You see, here's, that's what she said. There was no lower depth she could reach. He actually reached the real bottom. We can't take him any further than that. We can't do any more to him than that. He, we took him to the bottom. So he could lift us up. So she says, are you striving for supremacy? Are you striving for human praise? For human exaltation? You're afraid you won't receive all the deference and respect from human minds that you deserve? Is that like Christ? Let this mind be in you. I've, I've got a, an email to answer right now. A person's asking me that. What The Spirit of Christ, when it doesn't have that capital, does it mean his uh, mindset? Well, of course. His mindset is his spirit. It's that simple. The Spirit of Jesus is his divine mind. Shall pride be harbored after you've seen deity humbling himself till there was no lower point to which he could descend. Even God could not think of a lower place to go. He reached the bottom. Be astonished, O heavens, and amazed, the inhabitants. And what do we give him for that formality? Content. Pride, wickedness. 
He veiled his divinity with the garb of humanity. There it is. That's the spirit prophecy. That word garb is an excellent word for the Greek word there. He veiled his divinity with the garb of humanity, but he did not part with his divinity, a divine human savior. He is the second Adam. Well, let me ask you a question. If he was just like Adam after he fell, what need would there be for a second Adam, a different kind of Adam? <laughs> there never would have been a second Adam if he was just like the first one. What's the necessity? <laughs> he could only be a second Adam if he was going to be like the first Adam before he fell. Only he had to be superior to that first Adam. Otherwise he couldn't save the Adam that fell. Are you seeing the equation? If Adam was pure and holy, and Jesus has to save that pure, holy man, after he's a sinner, he's got to be able to save him as a pure, holy being. He's got to bring him back to that. So Jesus had to be superior to even that pure, holy being. That's in volume 2, Special uh, Spirit Prophecy, page 9. She said they had to be superior to Adam in his innocence. All right, continuing. He is the second Adam. The first Adam has created a pure sinless being without a taint of sin upon him. So in order to save that pure holy Adam, to bring him back again, Jesus had to be better than that pure holy Adam. And who was it that was able to do that? He, the second Adam, was in the image of God. That's superior. <laughs> he could fall. Jesus could fall. Adam, that is, the first Adam. He could fall. And he did fall <laughs> through transgressing. Because of sin, his posterity was born with inherent propensities of disobedience. But Jesus... Now, that takes care of the people that say Jesus had the propensity to sin. No, that's not what the Spirit of Prophecy says, neither does the Bible. She says right here, but Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. He took upon himself human nature, was tempted in all points as human nature is tempted. He was tested. He could have sinned. He could have fallen, but not for one moment was there in him <laughs> an evil propensity. Now she flat says it. How can a whole bunch of people deny that kind of a sentence? It's because they're listening to men instead of reading what the books say. Mm -hmm. Then she says his birth was a miracle of God. Well, if he was born just like the rest of us, what would he need a miracle for? There's just nothing about what people are saying that makes sense. His birth was a miracle of God. The, the angel said, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And then it goes down further. The angel said, The power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, who shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing. Now, we haven't talked about this very much. We need to talk about it. But Jesus is the only begotten Son of God in heaven. He is that holy thing there. And he is created the Son of Man as a baby, and He is called that holy thing as a human. So that human that was born of Mary is that holy thing. So, that 
human in the likeness of sinful flesh is holy. And I don't care how you try to manipulate that. You can't make a holy human being just like Adam after the fall. Until he's redeemed. Now, do you see that Jesus was born in heaven? He was born. He's the only begotten Son of God. And then he's born again as a man. So Jesus is born twice. Do we need to be born twice? <laughs> do you see that he did everything backwards from what we need to do it? At least the way we see it. He had to be born twice to be our Savior. So he was the Son of God in heaven and he's the Son of God on earth. In an entirely different sense now. In a new sense. He's born two times. But that's not the end of the story. I almost hesitate to say more. Because there are a few people. Who have really followed this through yet. When Jesus died. He was dead. Dead. Now a seventh day husband should understand that we're dead. He was in that tomb, that cave, sealed up with a rock. But the rock got rolled away. And he came out of there. The angel said, Awake, thy father calls thee. And Jesus awoke. He came out. How could he do that? How could he come out? People think he raised himself. Well, how could he do it if he was dead? Dead people can't raise themselves. The Bible says God raised him, the Father. It says it over and over again. Read Galatians 1 1. That's the way Paul starts out. God raised his son. When he raised him, Jesus was a living being again. A complete, total, with a form, with a spirit, with everything. He was a living being. He was born. Again. Born in heaven. Born as a man. And born at the resurrection. In the Psalms it says, This day I have begotten thee. <laughs> Psalm 2 7. <laughs> and Paul tells us that scripture applies in a very special way to the resurrection of Christ. This day. I have begotten me. You're born again. <laughs> You're alive. <laughs> and that, that was the theme of the early Christian. He's alive! He's alive! <laughs> okay. Let's continue here. These words, that holy thing, she says, these words, do not refer to any human being except to the Son of the Infinite God. Now, does that make him different from the rest of us? Come on, folks! We've got to start waking up to all these words and stop listening to the interpretations of theologians and doctors and ministers and whatever is telling us something different. I'll read that a sentence again. This is Jesus talking to us. These words do not refer to any human being except to the Son of the infinite God. Never in any way leave the slightest impression upon human minds that a taint of or an inclination to corruption rested upon Christ, or that he in any way yielded to corruption. He was tempted in all points, like a man is tempted, yet he is called that holy thing. Now, I have to warn you that I'm reading in a section of a letter 
that an entire group of people have been educated to ignore. Because this is called the Baker Letter. And in the Baker Letter, they're being taught that Baker was an adoptionist by theology, which means that Jesus was born as a human and later he became divine. And they say that Ellen White was fighting that man and telling him, don't you believe that because... And then they say that this Baker letter does not apply to our understanding of the nature of Christ. She was just talking to Baker. Well, I'm going to read you something that completely destroys that weirdness. Let me read it to you now. Here's Ellen White talking. The which is revealed is for us, not Baker is for us and our children. Let every human being be warned from the ground of making Christ altogether human, such a one as ourselves, for it cannot be. Now, they don't like that because it says Jesus was not such a well, one just like ourselves because they teach Jesus was just like us. They don't like this letter. They're trying to neutralize Ellen White's words but notice who she's talking to. She says, let every human being. How many people is that? Is that just Baker? That's the whole human race. This letter is for everybody. So that whole thing that they go through with the Baker letter stuff is nonsense. And it's worse than nonsense. They're trying to take away some of the spirit of prophecy from us and they think they're the ones who love the spirit of prophecy. There's a whole lot to this that I'm not willing to talk about yet because people aren't ready. They've got their heroes and they want to keep their heroes. Well, that's up to them. But we better go back to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White's very clear. Let every human being be warned from the ground of making Christ altogether human, such a one as ourselves. It cannot be the exact time when humanity blended with divinity is not necessary for us to know. Now, she's talking to this adoptionist with that sentence. But before, she said, let every human being. Now, that was when she's talking to everybody. Continuing. The first Adam fell. The second Adam held fast. That means he wasn't fallen. Do you get that? The first Adam fell, the second Adam held fast to God and his word under the most trying circumstances. He didn't waver for one moment. It is written with his weapon of resistance. Then she says, The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, nothing to respond to temptation. He had no inclination to sin. He had no propensity to sin. That means he was not like Adam's children because all of Adam's children have a propensity to evil. But she just says here, he had no propensity. There's nothing to respond to temptation. Not once did Christ step on Satan's ground to give him any advantage. Satan found nothing in him to encourage his advances. The two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ closely and inseparably one. Inseparably means he through all eternity, we'll have a human and divine blending of natures. He can, that can never be separated. He will always have the human form for all eternity. It's irreversible. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. What, what does she mean by Godhead? Divinity. The fact that he is divine is still his own. Even with the form of a man, he is still divine. His deity, there she's saying it, his deity could not be lost while, listen to that, his deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. That means his divinity could be lost. Now, that is absolute heresy to a Trinitarian. 
How can a three and one God have any one part of him lost? How is that possible to a Trinitarian? It's not possible. Because it takes all three to make God to them. But here we read that Jesus' divine self, his deity, could be lost if he was unfaithful to his father. And of course she says this in other ways. She says that he had committed one sin when he went into that tomb. That rock would have never been rolled away in all eternity. Jesus never would have come back to life. That's the Bible and spirit prophecy we're talking about here. She's totally consistent. She never changes the tune. I'm going to read that again so we can be sure. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. I'm going to skip down now. We're nearing the time here when we have to start closing. When Christ in dwelling glory flashed forth, in other words, himself, his divinity, his divine nature, when Christ in dwelling glory flashed forth, it was too intense for his pure and perfect humanity. What kind of humanity did he have? Pure and perfect. There's no sin there of any kind. No taint, nothing. He's a pure, perfect human being. Entirely to conceal. So they said they wanted to know who he really was. They hated it. Even when his divinity flashed forth. They could see it. They knew what it meant. But they, they still want to know, well, who are you? <laughs> who are you? And so what did Jesus say? You know who I am. You know who I am. <laughs> and what could they say? <laughs> you know who I am. You're not the only ones that know who I am. The devil knows who I am. The demons know who I am. There are several people out there who know who I am. You know who I am. How many people have you heard say truly, this is the Son of God? Have you heard anybody else say, thou art the Son of God, the, the living Christ? Have you heard any of that? You know who I am. <laughs> He's talking to the, the priests, the ministers. But they don't want to know who he is. They don't want to know. Christ left his position in the heavenly courts and came to this earth to live the life of, life of human beings. This sacrifice, what's the sacrifice? He gave up his form as God and became a human to live with us. That's the sacrifice. People think the sacrifice was dying on the cross. Well, that was a great sacrifice. But he had to be a human. He had to make the sacrifice first in order to make the death sacrifice. So she says, this sacrifice he made in order to show Satan's charge against God is false, that it is possible for man to obey the laws of God. So he came not only to die, but he had to live that 30 years first of perfect manhood, obeying all the laws of God, showing that Adam had absolutely no excuse to sin. He was a perfect man in heaven, in Eden. And he could have stayed that way. Jesus proved it. Jesus was on the earth and he proved it after sin was here, after all the problems. He was here with the devil on him all the time. And he proved, you don't have to sin. He proved it. Equal with the Father, honored and adored by the angels. In our behalf, Christ humbled himself, came to this earth to live a life of lowliness and poverty, to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Yet the stamp of divinity was upon his humanity. He came as a divine teacher to uplift human beings.
to increase their physical, mental, and spiritual in efficiency. There is no one who can explain the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. We don't know how he did it. We will probably never know how he did it, how he felt in the process. All we can know is that there was a lot of pain involved that even angels don't understand. They have no way of understanding the pain that God went through, Jesus, a God, the divine being, to become a man. The man, Christ Jesus, was not the Lord God Almighty. Well, if Jesus was not the Lord God Almighty, the fact is he's never been the Lord God Almighty. There are Maybe one or two scriptures in Revelation that make it appear that the King James translators mixed a sentence or two. They blended them instead of making new verses. They didn't know. They couldn't, because the original didn't have verses. They separated out the best they could. They make it appear that the Alpha and Omega is is the Almighty. I won't get into all that right now, but the point is, if you separate all the sentences, it's talking about the Son, and then it's talking about the Father. The Father is always God, the Almighty Lord. Always. He's always the God Almighty. Jesus is always Mighty God. Yes. So you have to keep that separated out. Ellen White knew all of these things. You have to read her the correct way. Let me read it again. The man Christ Jesus was not the Lord God Almighty, yet Christ and the Father are one. One what? One God? Of course not. They're one in purpose, in character. Okay? They're one in that way. She says that often enough. I don't know why a person would miss it. As a matter of fact, in that book, Trinity, they misquote Ellen White. They make her say that Jesus and the Father are one one being. But that's how she says on the page they quote. She says they're one in purpose and in character. They misquote Ellen White. Now, I'm not going to give you a motive for it. I don't know why they did it. All I know is they have misquoted Ellen White, and it's in black and white in print. All right. So it says, The deity did not sink under the agonizing torture of Calvary, Yet it's nonetheless true that God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son. Okay. In every possible way, I'm go- I think I'm going to finish with this particular paragraph because this paragraph really says something here. In every possible way, Satan sought to prevent Jesus from developing a perfect childhood, a faultless manhood, a holy ministry, and an unblemished sacrifice. Do you see the sequence? The devil knew Jesus was a perfect young man. Uh, it, uh, before age 12, all that whole time, from a baby to age 12, he knew that's a perfect human being. And then he saw him develop into a perfect young man. He saw him develop into a faultless manhood. Then he saw that faultless holy ministry. He saw it all. It's all perfection. Every inch of the way. He had to slot this rock in somehow. He's got to slot it someplace. He hasn't been able to do it. And an unblemished sacrifice. He couldn't even stop that. He couldn't stop that. He was defeated. He could not lead Jesus into sin. He couldn't discourage him. That is permanently. He couldn't get discourage him. To do something that wasn't in the plan. Because Jesus did get discouraged. Yes, he got depressed. He overcame his discouragement and depression. Yes, depression when uh, he was at Gethsemane. He, it was heavy on him, but he overcame it by faith. We'll get into that when we talk about Gethsemane. It says he had come to this earth. He, excuse me, he could not discourage him or drive him from the work he had come to this earth to do from the desert to Calvary. Why did she say from the desert to Calvary? Why did she say that? She didn't say from the cradle. 
Why did she say from the desert? It's after his baptism. It's when he was tempted, when he was tested as one of us. He had joined the transgressors. He now had our sins upon him. So she says from the desert, when he became like one of us, to the to Calvary, the storm of Satan's wrath, beat upon him. Satan saw it. He says he has made himself like one of the transgressors. Uh, this is my last chance. But of course, with our sins on him, it still wasn't his sin. It was our sin. And under that weight, he still was pure and holy. He says, but the more mercilessly it fell, the more firmly did the Son of God cling to the hand of his Father and press on in the bloodstained path. Now, did Jesus hang on to his own hand? <laughs> That's what Trinitarians have to teach. <laughs> if there's only one God and he has three roles, then he's holding his own hand. That's kind of dumb, don't you think? No, Jesus the Son of God held on to the hand of His Father. That's another person. We can see that. We can understand that. A child can understand that. All right. I think I'm going to stop right there. We begin next time with the necessities of a man. We have to see what the necessities are. Father, we thank you for these words. They're carefully crafted words. They're inspired words. They're words that come out of the mind of Jesus himself. Not just the thoughts. Some of these words were very carefully guarded. Bless us as we continue to give up the old doubts where we really believe what you're telling us. Help us not to reason them out, but to accept them as they come from you, as they come to us in the spirit of Christ. Help us to give up the skepticism that came from Socrates, through Plato, through the Catholic Church, through the apostasy of the so-called Protestant churches, and even the apostasy we see around us. Help us to be believers. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.